welcome Anjali to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on to be a guest. It's great to see you. Great um, to see you. And um, I would love to know, Anjali, are you well, actually? I love that question. Um, yes and no, which I think we all are in many ways right now. We are, but I'll speak to myself since you asked me this. Um, I am well physically. Um, I would say as much as I can be. Um, and at the same time, I'm also looking at so many things that are happening around me and in that sense, I feel like we are, I'm sitting, I always sit with this question about what does it really mean to be well in an unwell world? Um, so that's where I am. That's so true. It's that thing of, yeah, collective. Well, I mean, having it, your own wellness is, is all well and good, but you know, when you look around you, I agree. Um, well, like, actually, that kind of takes me on to my next question. I was going to say, how would you define wellness maybe compared to how let's say the mainstream might define it but maybe you've already answered that uh yeah i mean i don't want to you know obviously undermine personal wellness because i think that is such a, a privilege it's a gift um and something that we all need in our lives so obviously that's something that i cannot say it's not as important it's in fact critical um so the question about how would I define wellness I would say wellness is integration uh wellness is connection um connection to my own self within my own self my mind body spirit emotions thoughts whenever I feel like I'm in a place of where I can breathe uh where I can notice my thoughts where I can respond to something with um, skill, at least what I think is skill, um, where I feel less suffering in the way I move physically. Um, you know, all those things are suffering for me. And I'd love to just pick up on what you said there when you said what you define as skill. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? That's a great question. Uh, what is skill? Is that what you're asking? Well, how, yeah, you said how you define it. When I respond to something with skill, it, it means that I'm responding to something which is uh, taking in my positionality, uh, understanding my privilege, my roles, my responsibility, either in a relationship or in the larger world. And taking in also all the ways in which I have or I don't have, um, uh, you know, uh, capacity, you know, so that would be skill. Like, for example, if I'm burnt out and then and then I go and I do things, which I also have been, I mean, who, ha who amongst us haven't done that, right? Gone, stretched beyond our capacity. Totally. We might be doing that for a certain amount of time, but then we will get burnt out. And then, and then our the skill with which we operate op obviously sort of decreases because then we are just doing things out of sort of an automated response, but really not bringing into something that we do or something that we are sharing either as teachers, um, all of ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So we're just doing it in in uh, what's that called? Um, like a sort of a robotic sort of a response mm -hmm. rather than full embodied response yeah yeah it, I was wondering if you were if it was referring slightly to the sort of skill in action from Bhagavad Gita um, yes but, yes yeah. because for me that is a part that's exactly where we are learning all this from it is from the Bhagavad Gita what is skill in action it's not being it's not doing something you know in perfectly mm -hmm. so skill is not perfection skill is just ascertaining your own capacity and doing that knowing your role in the world which is what the Bhagavad Gita talks about yeah totally yeah. and um could you tell me and sorry by the way I have to just say because if this is on a video my dog did just come in <laughs> like, if you saw like some movement behind me my husband dragged her out so sorry that was distracting <laughs> no I no to... I, I have a dog too and right now I've left him outside because the sun is out in California so I want him to yeah 
take advantage of of the sun so yeah, I totally get it she just obviously wanted to come and ask a question but not this <laughs> <laughs> anyway um, as I was saying um could you tell me a little bit about your own journey in uh, like you know in and out of wellness or your 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 um yeah could you just just tell me your story a little bit I guess my story it's a long one um or so in in a capsule it is um I come from India uh I've lived equal number of years in India and the United States and um I've studied communication, worked with folks and organizations, uh, doing all kinds of things from cultural cultural studies to communication studies, that kind of stuff. And then at the age of 37, I was diagnosed with uh, early stage breast cancer. Mm. That sort of obviously changed the world for me. And uh, I was privileged enough to have access to excellent healthcare and uh, doctors and uh, family who had supported me through it. And Thus, I came to my yoga mat first at 37. And I was born in India, but I never really liked yoga asana much. Um, and when I came to my first class, I knew that I wanted to, you know, teach this first of all, right away. First class, I was like, oh, something has happened. And I want to teach this for folks who are going through cancer. And so my teacher was like, come to the second class before you want, decide you want to be a teacher, you know. Um but long story short, w practiced and then started understanding where I am in my physical body and how that relates to my emotional experiences, um, sort of building a re rebuilding a connection to a bot to my physical body, which often people who are who have gone through trauma kind of learn how to dissociate. And that was happening for me a lot. Um, I didn't know that, but I got to know that after. Anyway, so did my 200 hours teacher training, which is like sort of the foundational thing that many people here in the United States do. And after that, uh, in that there was one teacher who came to teach people uh, how to teach people who are going through health challenges like yoga, uh, like cancer and other chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I need to I want to do that, you know, so I kind of followed her around. I was an apprentice. Then I worked uh, with uh, in the hospital and uh, cancer care programs. Then I finished my 300 hours. And once I started studying that, I really wanted to study more of yoga philosophy, quote unquote, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, um, and that's been where I now share. I share yoga philosophy uh integrating that with history because i do think that we have to study anything with with context uh of the times in which those teachings emerged mm -hmm. and really digging up obscure histories uh because you know the histories that are often told or narrated are the ones which are um the dominant narrative so really looking up obscure histories and uh sharing that and inviting people into sitting with complex truths yes I love that I love I mean I, I I know it's very vast but I never know why people don't want to study the philosophy or they want to leave it just with the asana the yoga postures because mm -hmm. it's like I mean maybe I maybe it's because I'm a bit of a geek but I just think it's so rich like you just it's such a great rabbit hole to go down and to continue and to get lost in and and as you say, like bringing the obscure histories to the fore, because the mainstream ones are that, as you say, they're there for a, they're there for a reason, and it's not a good one, you know. Mm -hmm. So I agree, like bringing, and yeah, I mean, I think that you, maybe you agree. I just feel like bringing a, a multitude of stories, um, and as you say, uh, being able to hold multiple truths, complex truths. It must just, in terms of empathy, as a source of well being. Mm -hmm. It, that's mm -hmm. such a big feature right absolutely empathy and uh, empathy and compassion and vulnerability um because those are i think superpowers uh we need to really l learn how to be vulnerable in in a in a society that wants us to take the shortcut and you know 
take a shortcut about many things, including including our asana practice. Um, so to be vulnerable, to be open, and to cultivate spaces that allow, invite vulnerability. I think that's what that's what a teacher can really do. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, empathy. Build, I, that's what we are hoping to build in our uh, practice of yoga. Right? We are supporting our nervous system. We are nour nourishing our nervous system, and that's what yoga practice allows us. Mm -hmm. Has a potential. Um, and each one of us will respond to a certain thing in a different way. So obviously it's not a one size fit all thing. And once we are nourishing, continuously nourishing, supporting our nervous system, then we hopefully can respond to another's suffering, another situation with, uh, with connection, with an understanding, you know, mm -hmm. with an embodied understanding mm -hmm. that can be sustained, mm -hmm. you know. Totally, totally. And it can be in and in, maybe it's a slightly overused phrase, but like when you when your cup is full, um, mm -hmm. you can that you just have more to give. And I think that's yeah, that's I, I, I agree. I think it's fantastic. I wanted to ask you as well. Um, what um, what would be your kind of your daily non negotiables that sort of keep you well, or, or regular non negotiables, if you like? My cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my my couple cup of garam garam masala chai is mm -hmm. something that is a non-negotiable, hopefully, and um, some sort of movement practice. I really, really think that the the times I feel the most energetic is when I have uh you know been in my body in some way or the other. And my own dosha in the Ayurvedic system, you know, is is one of fire and uh, wind. So it's um, it's pitta and vata. So knowing my own self and knowing my propensity to burn out, you know, mm -hmm. I, I have that fire. I also need to keep that fire going. Otherwise, I can do things and then with great intensity and then just burn out and crash. So I have to, I take sometimes breaks if I can. Uh, like like I was just mentioning before you hit the record button, Nell, that uh, before meetings or rather in between meetings, I take some time. Like today there was sun. So I just went outside for a couple of minutes and just sat and, you know, just wasn't, wasn't my breath and just, took in the sun rays as much as I could. Um, so those are some of the things that I try to do. Like in every day, if I can inculcate breaks of, of being in connection with my breath. Um, you know, people always think that we have to have this disciplined, you know, austere, no, you know, all these things that we are told. And Ideal in an ideal utopian world, maybe we, everybody has like one and a half hours of everyday asana and pranayama and meditation, and then you go out into the world. I mean, I hear all the stuff that teachers are supposed to do. I honestly can't. Uh, that's not who I am, and I have tried. I'm forty nine, so I I have. It's not like I haven't tried. Mm -hmm. I have tried, and what is sustained for me throughout the years is that I do do some physical move either either asana or something like a anything it can be like a tabata thing or even dance like I'm a dancer um or even on the elliptical like something cardio and weight strength building like any of that right um for like in for the first part of the day I like to finish that at the first part of the day I think that really allows me to kind of discharge some of my energy and that that built up nervous system energy um and then throughout the day i take in if i can like just five minute breaks of just breath my breath practice either pranayama or just a, just noticing my breath so some sort of uh rest uh in in between so those are the things that i try to do and i try to read every day um i i think the pandemic was a in many ways, a reconnection to my reading. I read a lot and I also have like at least three books that I read simultaneously. So that's probably not a good thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if it works but, for you, great. 
<laughs> yeah, I am a geek like you, so I think that's why we get along. Um, I read I read all kinds of genres. Like I'm reading this novel at the same time I'm reading the epic Mahabharata. Wow. Uh, and then what else? I'm reading um this book on social change. So like three different books at the same time. Mm. I often I often do the same. I'll have maybe a fiction book. I mean, my reading's been a bit it's fallen behind lately but I do the same I'll have like a fiction book and then I'll have a yoga a text one of one of the texts um and I'll sort of just depending on what headspace I'm in if I can yeah. go deep I'll go into the text but yeah they're like sitting by my bed and then there's a few others as well and yeah yeah hopefully they'll they'll get read properly um on the movement thing I wanted to ask you about because sometimes I see you share on your social media you do these really beautiful sequences is it like a dancing warrior or uh, I it's I, my own thing uh I you can call it a dancing warrior but I think there's so much of overlap I'm an Indian classical dance student so there's a lot of overlap between uh Indian classical dances many of them um and asana uh, they sort of developed around the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, I like to bring in those movements because it just feels good in my body. And I, I like to uh, I like to do that whenever I feel I need some. For me, it's actually fun to do. Like I like to integrate those things. So whenever I feel like, you know, totally going down the feeling up really upset about the world around me which happens a lot especially when you are a space holder for all kinds of people mm -hmm. you're hearing so many stories and you you want to be present to everything mm -hmm. uh you I need that I need that sort of a discharge of like I want to do something fun and for me this kind of movement integrating with asana is of is what gives me joy so I, I do that I love that that's so nice and um do you have any kind of, as well as your your daily or regular practices, do you have anything that maybe you've done over the past year or even few years that you've really built up as sort of either like a, a healthy habit or even just something you observe in your life that's that's really um, that's grown over time? If that make does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's also more than grown I look at what has sustained mm -hmm. you know it's not like something that you do when you experiment and experimenting is great you you know you should everyone should if they have the capacity to do to look at different things and see how that fits in your life um what I look at is how, what is sustained for me and what has sustained for me is like a physical practice a breath like pranayama practice um you know, something simple, as simple as oiling uh, my body and hair, because it all comes from my, my own lineage. Like I put coconut oil on everything. Like I remember growing up, my grandmother and my father would go on and on about coconut oil because we grew up in coastal, um, like coastal India was where my ancestors come from. So they would go on and like everything, the antidote to everything was coconut oil. <laughs> like you put it in food, you put it on yourself, you put yeah, it yeah. everywhere, you know. So um, I, it's funny that I go back to that and, and I cook with ghee and, you know, so all those things I've learned as as a part of my uh, my heritage. And I was telling, I tell my daughter that same thing too. I'm like, oh, you know, you should put coconut oil. And she's like, mm -hmm. oh, let's get this and that and from Sephora. And, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, that's great. But put coconut oil, you know, yeah, so it's, yeah, funny yeah. How, it's funny how you, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How you repeat those things, which, which you've been told as a parent, you're like doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's funny actually, because, um, I'm actually studying a, at the moment a naturopathic health co course and one of the teachers said don't because in it's I mean they're quite you know thorough about like no toxins and all of that but they said don't use anything that your your grandparents wouldn't recognize the ingredients of which I thought was a really simple way um I, so I agree with that I I think even in terms of food uh though I you know I I, I think toxins are very um uh, I have a lot of opinions about the word toxins. Yeah, I know. Uh, a bit of but <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a bit of a privileged thing to say in many ways. Nice. But um, but I do think that you know we should, if we can, eat 
things which we recognize. Like we recognize the ingredients. Uh, we know what's going in into what we're eating. I think that's like a really good way to ensure that we are informed, uh, you know, because otherwise it's harder to um, to regulate our own physical bodies and those are the, that's related to our emotional well-being and all of this is a privilege mm -hmm. uh, because not many have access to all of this so people are get you know who can be that's why I always go back to this question of what does it really mean to be well in the world which doesn't allow for many folks to not be well uh, well actually you know that's because because something that I've noticed one that I've really noticed actually maybe more so i mean i can't speak for other countries but in the uk now ghee is all the rage you know they people have discovered its health benefits and i think actually um padma lakshmi shared something where she saw in a shop it said that it said a butter a ghee butter and she was like that's literally butter butter yeah <laughs> like chai tea is tea tea and um and just the way i mean i don't know what you think about this but like yeah, so sorry to go back to my point about ghee. I remember back in like when I was a kid, I think the NHS was saying like, don't eat this. It's it's high fat, you know, and people thought fat was the worst thing ever. And it, you know, it's really insulting to a whole culture of people for which it's real, the, really the basis of a yeah. lot of their cooking. And then and then you know, it must feel quite frustrating, right, for the, then to turn around and be like, whoa, this is a health benefit. Exactly. Now let's sell it for, you know, 10 pounds or $10 for a small jar exactly I, I mean it's it's part of whole this whole thing on appropriation of cultural uh, practices and teachings and then reselling that to us saying oh wow now that we've discovered it you know it's like the best thing ever um i see this all the time here in the united states too the ghee thing is like huge um coconut oil was another thing now everybody's talking about oiling your hair we've done oiling our hair for thousands of years we have paintings and sculptures which go back to like the eighth century which talk about you know uh, oiling and all those all, all those things so it's it's the whole dominant cultural narrative right i mean we are are the practices of the indigenous folk are always taken and taken out of context then they are ridiculed and then they come back and they say oh yeah by the way this is great <laughs> um yeah uh, and it's funny, you know, it's sold back to India now. I see in India that they are going back to uh, coconut oil because the, in the middle, they were all like olive oil is the thing, you know, because everybody was like olive oil. Mm -hmm. And then they said avocado oil, even though avocado and olives are not indigenous to India, but the West sells it to places like India saying this is the right thing. And mm -hmm. now it's going back to coconut oil and ghee. So it's... Um, who, who owns the narrative of these conversations? Mm -hmm. who, who is the one who's driving these conversations? Well, quite, yeah. It's kind of a, I guess it's, you know, you could go as far as to say that that sort of repackaging, reselling, it has, it has a colonial feel to it. So would you, I don't know, you might have even used this expression or maybe it was somebody else, but that kind of idea of how to decolonize a wellness practice. Oh, I think we should. Uh, yeah, uh, I I don't know whether I've used it, but I think we should. Decolonization is a huge thing. Um, in the sense, first of all, we have to we are learning from our from the, those folks whose land we are occupying on, right? Like right now, I'm a guest here, and this is, you know, those are the the leaders of uh, the land back movement, and that's the that's the teachings that we are learning, and that's why I try to not use that word other than when I talk about yoga, because yoga is a practice that has been colonized. And um, in fact, colonization brought us yoga to the modern world. So only in that context, I try, I use that. Otherwise, I try not to use that word a lot, because otherwise, I'm, I'm taking away from folks of that movement, which is the land back movement in the States. Yeah, in, in the United States. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, maybe this is like a too big of a question for for one conversation but um if you could give yoga teachers and sort of other practitioners in the in the similar field or people who are sharing a practice that is not from their own ancestry uh, ancestry their own you know their own heritage let's yeah. say yeah what would be maybe 
like three things you would you could advise yoga teachers let's say like western yoga teachers to implement i know again that's a big big question <laughs> and i know your life's work is all about that but if you could if you could distill it to like i don't know three things um I, I avoid, first of all, I avoid these things about these three things to do, uh, but, but because I love you, I'm dead. <laughs> um, if I were to say three things, if I, uh, A, learning the history, learning the history and the, and the, not the history, but many histories from different sources about that particular culture and relationship to your own background. You know, I think that is the key thing, one of the key things, right? So as a brown immigrant, Indian, legally immigrant person here, what's my relationship to a particular practice from another culture? What is my, what is my ancestral history in relationship to that particular culture? So that's one thing. Um, and acknowledging different teachers acknowledging different people who have contributed to what you're learning because i think in the modern world we are often going to like creating quote unquote a brand mm -hmm. right what is my brand and how am i going to do this and it's all very individual and it's all supposed to be you 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 creating this particular brand but it's actually not me or you or anybody else in fact even the even the bhagavad gita is not Krishna teaching. It's 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 a distillation of Upanishads. It's a dis, which is again a distillation of the Vedas. So a, yoga teachings are iterative. They are built upon something else. So if if we have to disrupt this whole individualistic me 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 thing in yoga spaces or wellness spaces or whatever, to really acknowledge uh, people who have contributed to your learning your experience you know i think that is really missing in the world right now that sort of decentering of oneself and allowing inviting acknowledging uh all all contributions because then what happens is that everyone feels that there is a part of them that is that belongs to mm. the space Otherwise, everyone is like I, I people are like i don't see myself here you know, only some of us see ourselves in a yoga space. Some people don't even see us, see their, mm -hmm. themselves in the yoga space. So I think that would be the second thing. So learning multiple histories of and your relationship to that practice, acknowledging the contributions of, uh, you know, different people and the past. And the third would be to really shift from non like the binary thinking uh good bad yes no the sort of thinking that we are all going to and sit with the complexity the paradoxes of all of this mm -hmm. i love that i love i love complexity i, I welcome it in <laughs> we yeah and i think that's what the, that's what our practice should allow us to really parse through the complexity otherwise we are just all the time being boxed in with uh you know labels like you know so but then we are far more complex people having different experiences and just having these labels are not enough so also acknowledging our privilege uh, you know whenever we do something i think that's like the number one thing i would say actually that yeah it's so important i mean i think I mean, I can speak for myself, I'll be honest, you know, especially when, you know, there's economic pressure and things like that, what you said earlier about the pressure to feel like you have to have a brand and you have to have a, a niche, um, mm -hmm. or I think Americans say niche, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I learned in a very British system, so I say niche too. <laughs> niche, niche, niche. Um, and yeah, and it, it's funny because it, it literally flies in the face of what yoga is, which is union and everyone you know it, it we're all like this small part of the whole um mm -hmm. so yeah it's balancing it isn't it it's like you know you, you feel people feel like they have to be business-like about what they're doing teachers you know doing that as a as a job if you like 
but then balancing mm-hmm. it with integrity so that's mm-hmm. that's definitely ongoing work for me um all of us all of us really i mean uh, as a person with caste privilege i'm grappling with my own uh, ancestry and all the uh, and the harm that that has caused in the world uh, in the worlds that they have op- caste has operated in so it's being you know open to saying that we all are folks who have come with problematic backgrounds and what do we do with that and how do we move forward with that you know Mm -hmm. could you um if you don't mind could you tell me a little bit about caste privilege and how that sort of has manifested in your life well i mean i have now launched a new podcast from the accessible podcast which is called the love of yoga and in which i my first guest is the Tenmori Sanjana Rajan, who is a mm-hmm. caste abolition leader, and uh, she talks about her book, The Trauma of Caste. Um, so, it, the caste is one of the most oldest social stratification systems or paradigms that have operated in the world, um, and it is it like thousands of years ago uh, operated and still operates in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, parts of Afghanistan. Nepal, uh, you know, the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. So Bangladesh. And um, it it started off as like a division of labor, you know, like, so we had the scholars and the priest, the kshatriyas, the rulers and the uh, the army, the merchant caste and the, the laborers, the farmers, the cobblers and and then there were the groups which were not a part of any of these castes who were like the people who were doing the most menial of all tasks kind of thing they were called the Dalits Mm -hmm. then there were the Adivasis the tribes the indigenous tribes of a population so all of the the sort of divisions uh, in the beginning was far more fluid where people could shift between different occupations and all of that and then it started becoming far more rigid and far more solidified as populations grew and as there was more complexity with influx of newer uh, rulers from the uh, neighboring countries and so lot of you know lot of complexity there but basically it became far more rigid and then there was a structure of a uh, power difference between the folks who had access to material as well as spiritual philosophical resources like the brahmins the scholars the priests they were the ones who composed and commented on the vedas and the sutras and the they are the ones whose whose, whose work we study who could who could access sanskrit mm. and there were the folks who couldn't so then there was this whole uprising there were newer uh categories created because of various things but um and colonization so then there was this rigid sort of a structure where people had power and wielded that power and caused a lot of harm and violence for folks who don't have that power. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I come from like a subcategory of the Brahmin caste, which is the scholar caste. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I've always grappled with, even without, you know, being even without the recent past, uh, even as a child, I've always had a problem with it. Um, and so when I first launched my podcast, I wanted someone who is uh, out of solidarity, uh, someone who is a leader of that movement. So Tenmori Sandhara Rajan is, is one of the folks who are doing this work in the United States. And I, I think globally, she uh, she's a co-founder of this organization called Equality Labs, mm-hmm. um, uh, which, which, which does a lot of caste abolition work. So yeah, so... I think colonization made it rigid. Uh, you know, the British, when they colonized India, they saw this mind boggling array of people having all kinds of belief systems and values and uh, lifestyles and all of that. So they wanted to create categories. So col- colonization works in terms of operates through categorization. Right. So they're like, if I can box people in into one particular category, it makes it far more structured and then that makes it far more easier to govern rather than having all these people doing all the all different things um so it created a census system where people could then had to identify as belonging to a certain caste and sort of that sort of institutionalized 
uh, system that already existed. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of harm happens in, uh, in these uh, populations and the diaspora even uh, based on caste. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's improving in any way? It is improving, yes, in the sense that there is more awareness and people are learning to talk about it. Uh, it's very invisible because we all look the same, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, it's invisible because nobody really talks about it. There's also a lot of fear to acknowledge one's caste, especially from the caste oppressed perspective, mm -hmm. uh, because there is so much discrimination and harm that goes on. Mm -hmm. So people don't really even acknowledge that they are from a certain caste. Mm -hmm. And it's only now that it is being talked about uh, as it should be. And, uh, you know, uh, but having said that, and because of leadership like the Equality Labs, because of organizations like the Equality Labs and who who's doing this work here and many other organizations in places like India, uh, though the caste has been abolished, like the discrimination based on caste is abolished in, in India, uh, it still goes on. It's like racism here, you know, like discrimination based on race is abolished here in the United States, but obviously there's racism. Um, so similarly, you know, in that sense. And it's gotten better in the sense there's more awareness and not gotten better because people are still getting harmed and killed and all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And does that mean that say, you know, does that, would that, I guess the answer is yes, but does that change people's, it affects people's access to well-being, both in of India course. and maybe in the diaspora as well, would you say, or mainly in India? Uh, I would say both and probably not as much in the diaspora because it is far more like, um, I mean, I would say, I would think that there is a little bit more access to resources here, uh, far more dire in like, in in the cities, towns and the villages and even the cities in in places like India mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm. and um I mean maybe we've already answered this as well just because you it's so interesting talking to you Angeli honestly it's, it's this is such a pleasure this conversation um is there something that's sort of touted around in the wellness space if you like that you would like to see the back of or that you think is actually quite <laughs> harmful I mean, there's probably multiple things. Ooh, um, many things. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're a youth obsessed culture. Yes. You know, we're a youth obsessed society. Uh, I would, uh, that there is a certain, the value that we emphasize on youth, uh, on looking a certain way, on, on, fitness uh, being defined a certain way um if only we could you know ancient cultures uh, often centered wisdom and older experienced people like that was where the sort of the the nucleus of a family used to be right mm -hmm. and that was all sort of dispelled it's been dispelled because of the nuclear family system where we i mean I, we don't have access to our grandparents and our grand, you know, uncles and aunts and all of that anymore. Um, and not saying all older people are wise. Uh, older people can be annoying and not wise also. <laughs> but I'm saying just just having that sort of access to wisdom uh, gained by lived experience, I think, um, that direct connection and that emphasis that we 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 place on looking young. Yeah. I feel <laughs> pressure. I mean, I'm not I think we all do. <laughs> I think we all do. I'm 49 and I, you know, um, I still feel, uh, I, I'm, I'm openly acknowledging my age all the time. And I realize that not many people do. Uh, everybody's like, if, there is a certain sort of a thing that happens when you're you know when you don't want to say your age for some reason and I'm like it's a privilege to be old mm -hmm. uh to get older mm -hmm. and it's an honor that we are here uh, so we need to disrupt that for me that is a that's one thing one of the things I, yeah I mean I remember growing up my I, I was it's funny when I remember my mom turning 40 and because she was 
at the time kind of think, saying, oh, I'm old, I'm old. So I had, I took great pleasure in telling everyone, I was like, my mom's 40 and she would, <laughs> you know, she would cringe. And it, I just remember that. And I was thinking, cause I was a kid and I didn't understand. I was thinking, why does she, why is she like this? Yeah. Um, but interestingly, the older she's gotten, she's, she cares way less now. So maybe that's yeah. also the beauty of aging. She's now kind of like, yeah, I'm 66. Great. <laughs> yeah, I I'm getting there. I'm all I've always been there, but I think um I love it that I'm older. I think been uh, uh, you know, the past decade has been wonderful. In I mean, it's been challenging and hard and all of that, but also in in other ways, but in also in knowing who I am, uh you know, it's I I don't really care anymore I don't want that, that. I, I hear people say that and I'm just like I'm I, I give less of a fuck now than I did in my 20s <laughs> yeah and I can't wait to give even less of a fuck. <laughs> I don't give a fuck anymore it's just wonderful I can be who I am I can say you know it's just wonderful so I I recommend this highly <laughs> yeah I was just about to ask if you had any final kind of advice for, for how to be well but maybe it's just getting older oh gosh yeah that's such a privilege <laughs> but get older with um get older getting oh I was just telling someone this you know I don't want to grow old uh gracefully whatever the fuck that means <laughs> <laughs> I know I don't understand that one either I don't know what that means what is I'll that? say that I want to grow old honestly I want to grow old fiercely um I want to grow old truthfully you know I um that I think for me would be would be a prayer that is so that what a prayer I mean what a good prayer to have I love that oh well actually this has been such a pleasure I've really enjoyed talking to you I love um, talking to you too and thank you so much for being on of course thank you